So, what, uh, what really did happen in Rendlesham Forest that night? Ian Ridpath, journalist and a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, dismisses Colonel Holt's account. And tonight he offers his own theory. Ian Ridpath. <laughs> Ian, you believe that the Rendlesham landing wasn't a UFO landing at all? No, I don't. I was intrigued by this case because it seems to be that irrefutable evidence that we were talking about earlier, and it's backed up by the word of Colonel Charles Holt uh, and uh, written documentary evidence. But if you look at the different aspects of the case, you can find that there are perhaps many different things which have been lumped together to make the whole thing seem more mysterious than it really is. Now, to start with, the light they saw at 3 o'clock in the morning, apparently falling, something crashing into the forest. I discovered there was a bright fireball, a natural piece of space debris burning up in the atmosphere at exactly that time. I think that's probably what they saw. Then the men went out into the forest. They saw this flashing white light. They said it filled, it seemed to illuminate the forest with a white light. Now, someone had called the police. The local police came and took a look. They searched the area. They couldn't find anything. They said the lights were the Orford Ness Lighthouse. Now, I should explain about the Orford Ness Lighthouse because this comes up quite a lot in the case. The Orford Ness Lighthouse sits on the coast uh, at Orford, about five miles away from where they were in the forest. And it appears very much closer when you're in the forest at night. It's a very bright light. It flashes away. And because of the way the land falls towards the coast, it looks as though it hovers just above uh, ground level. And as you move about, the thing seems to move about too. Now, the following morning, as we saw on the film, the men went out into the forest again. They saw what they claimed were landing marks. They were only very small, they were only about an inch and a half deep, they were only about the size of your hand. Um, this seems quite small for something maybe the size of a tank, which is supposed to come from uh, interstellar space, land on three little tripod legs. The police were called out again. They said, to us, that looks like um, the marks of an animal. Now, the local forester also saw all those marks. He was quite sure that they were just rabbit scrapings. I think he's here, isn't he, Vince Thurkettle? You're here? Yeah. And is that, is that your opinion? It certainly was, yeah. That it was simply? I, I mean, I was really excited when, when the rumours started going, and I've been consistently disappointed as each piece of evidence comes up. Coming up, Josh, Vince, while you're there, I mean, could a thing the size of the tank that they described on the film have actually moved through those trees? Well, over the years, the 17 years, the opinion keeps changing. The, the craft was 30 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet. I mean, the trees are actually 10 to 15 feet apart. So it's almost like the story has changed to fit the site. Can I ask Nick Pope uh, about the radiation readings? Because they, they, we reported in the film, are very high. That, that's right. I mean, all these theories about lighthouses, and I've heard it said that the, uh, the triangular indentations in the forest floor were due to rabbits. Well, they must be radioactive rabbits, because I checked these out with the Defence Radiological Protection Service uh, when I was working uh, at Secretariat Air Staff in the MOD, and they certainly did confirm to me, yes, of course, there's background radiation everywhere. We wanted to make sure it wasn't that, and it was indeed ten times normal. So the lighthouse theory, clever though it is, I'm afraid just doesn't work. Frank Close, how do you explain this radiation? Well, the radiation is unusual because it's for a rare occasion we've at last got something you can go and check. And so I did. And what I did, I've got hold of, this is the British equivalent of the standard US Air Force issue, which is used usually for measuring huge amounts of radiation, like in nuclear blasts and so forth. All you need to notice is there's a dial on the front here, and it looks very much like the speedo in your car. Now, the speedo in your car is great for measuring whether you're exceeding the speed limit or not, but you know what it's like, you're stuck in the traffic jam doing nothing, but it's still flickering at the bottom. We know from the report that Colonel Holt made at the time that the amount of radiation they thought they were detecting on their machine was very, very small, 0.1. And we've checked with the makers of the US equivalent, and they said, their quote is, that this measurement was the bottom reading of the machine and was of little or no significance at all. So it was not possible with the device to measure that small amount. But what I have got here is something that you could have done, and it's this, and it shows the other thing, which is, even if the radiation was 10 times bigger, it doesn't matter very much at all. Look. In the room, can you hear the Geiger counters going off already? Because there's radiation all around us. Here I've got some rock that you can find lying around if you live in Cornwall all over the place. It's pitch blend. And that sends it up a hundred times. 
sending radiation backgrounds up by a factor of 10 means nothing at all. Thank you very much. That was impressive. Ian Red, 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 Ridpath, thank you very much for being with us. I think it was vastly overstated, however. Stanton Friedman yeah. says we are overstated that, but there are more arguments to come. We've heard a few, but now let us hear from the man who was there that night, Colonel Chuck Holt. <laughs> now, Colonel Holt, you've heard these various comments and explanations. Seventeen years ago, do you still hold to your story? I certainly do, and I'd like to make a couple of comments. One, the story, so to speak, as far as the size and shape, has not changed through the years. I took original statements from the three people that actually approached the object and did it a day afterwards, and they all said the same thing when they were independently interviewed, and they all said it was approximately nine feet on a side and it was triangular. They have not changed that story. Now, many other people have come forward that supposedly were there that I questioned, but we won't get into that, and said lots of various and sundry things, but those three people have said the same thing consistently and do to this day. Also, the indentations in the forest, I have in my hotel room a caster plast from one of those indentations, and there are other ones made, there were three made, and they are not an inch, they are approximately three and a half inches, and they're consistent in diameter, approximately 14 to 15 inches. And so, it was an equilateral triangle. An equilateral triangle. And as far as your radiation, the machine we used was calibrated. Yes, it was on the low range. And we went around the forest, and that area, that specific area was hot, hottest in the center of the triangle. The rest of the forest was cold, so to speak, nothing but background radiation. I was not alarmed. I'll admit it was a minimal amount, but it was certainly above background radiation. And that's something we can never settle, I realize. Can I just question right, you on one thing, sir, I... because you did make a testimony at the time, and being at the time is perhaps the most important thing. And you said that the depressions were one and a half inches deep. You've just now said they were much bigger than that. Now, I have, what's the, pl the, right I have the plaster cast. So was your original statement wrong? I have the plaster cast, and you can see the plaster cast. I wish I had brought it to see you. Yes, I wish you had. That's mm. a nice thought. It would uh, be nice to <laughs> Penny has someone in the audience who has a view on this, haven't you, Penny? I do indeed, yes. Uh, Jenny Randalls was one of the original investigators at Randlesham and has actually visited the site. What do you think happened? Well, I've been following this case all over the world, tracking down evidence for 17 years, and I've absolutely no doubt that uh, these airmen did see something quite extraordinary in the forest. However, it's enormously complicated by the fact that on Orford Ness Island, apart from the lighthouse, the National Security Agency, that's the NSA, one of America's most secret intelligence agencies, were carrying out an extraordinary experiment. Officially, it was an over-the-horizon radar test. That's to try and detect aircraft from lots and lots of miles away. But some of this energy, we understand, Stand, leaked out into the into space and we also know that there was a military satellite from the Soviet Union which was nuclear powered which was decaying in its orbit that night and it burned up over Rendlesham Forest and it changed its orbital path as it did that in a quite extraordinary fashion we suspect it's possible that some experiment was going on where they may have actually used this equipment to scramble the computers on board that Soviet satellite and may even have brought it down. Now, of course, if that's true, it gives you a reason, regardless of whether there are any aliens in Rendlesham Forest, why there could have been a massive cover-up. And I've seen... So you're many, saying it's a military cover-up? Well, I've seen many times the, the governments of the world use the UFO phenomenon as a kind of smokescreen. They hide their own tests of secret technology, knowing that if people see these things, they're going to report them as UFOs. And it's great they can get away with doing things in areas they normally wouldn't be able to. OK, well, we're going to cover that a bit more in the, later on in the programme. Michael? Yes, yes, we are. We shall come to that. But at the moment, uh, Colonel Holt, it has been suggested a military cover-up you were a military man. Were you part of that? Definitely not. I'd be willing to take a polygraph test on that. I, I can't say it wasn't. To the best of my knowledge, it wasn't, and I certainly was not a party to it. Can if there was something. Can secrets be kept by the military? Generally, but uh, with some success, yes. But generally, generally, things come out over a period of time. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.